Welcome to the sixth episode of our iSense Q&A series. I am Erin Manning, the Communications Manager for the UCL-led iSense project, which is an EPSRC-funded interdisciplinary research collaboration. Our researchers are working to develop tools and technologies to track, test and treat infectious diseases. This Q&A series is a chance to speak to and learn from experts working in fields related to infectious disease surveillance, testing, treatment and beyond. Today we are speaking to Professor Christina Pargel and Dr Mendy Zhuang from University College London and Dr Roger Beecham from the University of Leeds on the topic Visualising the Pandemic and Other Health Outcomes. So hi everyone, I'm, um, I'm the postdoc working on the ISENS 2 visualization flagship. I'm really happy um, to be here today. Yeah. Thanks, Mengdi and Christina. Hi, I am Christina Poggle. I'm a professor of operational research and director of the UCL operational um, clinical operational research unit. And I kind of helped with um, some of the presentation on iSense and some of the language and also sit on independent stage. Thanks very much, Christina and Roger, would you like to go? Hi, yeah, I'm Roger Beecham. I'm a lecturer uh, in data science in the geography department at Leeds um, and I have a visualisation background. Thanks very much. Thank you all for joining us today. It's so wonderful to have a breadth of experience across health and public communications and community, uh, human computer interaction and geography. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I'll get into questions. My first question is, what makes good data visualization particularly for health? Um, Mengi, maybe you'd like to start this one. Uh, yeah, sure. So I think um, for me, I come from a human computer interaction perspective, and I think a really good visualization should think of what they want the user to know and what has the key messages and what kind of actions, takeaway messages they could have. Um, this is quite difficult for health data because obviously we have lots of, uh, we're flooded by variables and the timelines and we have special variations, so incredibly complicated. Um, so um, digest uh, this through the message will be the key part. Yeah. Thanks very much, Mengzi. And Christina, do you have anything you'd like to add? I think for me, it's simplicity. So I think really complicated um, graphics can be really good for people who are already very familiar with data and used to looking at it and can provide a lot of information. But for other people, it just confuses people and I think that you need, you need people to be able to kind of grasp what you're trying to show really quickly I think because otherwise I mean just as a stupid example I remember we were looking at a plot a few years ago that was um, and the main information was where the dots were on the y-axis and then it had um, like error bars around it but the error bars were solid color and people read it as a as a bar chart and ignored the dots completely, which would never have occurred to me because I knew what the thing was showing. So it's that, that kind of thing where you have to be really careful about, okay, how would someone who doesn't really know what this is showing interpret that information? And would they know where to look? Because a lot of people don't really read access labels. They don't necessarily look at that. They just kind of think and things going up, down, <laughs> you know, so you kind of have to think about how people are looking at it from that perspective. Yeah. Thanks very much, Christina. Roger, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I'd agree with both of those uh, points and um, I mean that when I saw this question I immediately thought of well it depends on what you're using visualization for are you using it for communication which we've talked about or are you using it for analysis I think when you're using it for communication particularly with health data it's all about kind of communicating risk and although there have been some really nice visualizations from journalists data journalists looking at um, you know doing quite detailed analysis of COVID-19 case data which we'll probably talk about I don't think there have been that many uh, concentrated on um, communicating like risk ratios and um, conditional probabilities which are really important right now as we're looking at sort of vaccine stuff so I think there's quite a lot that hopefully we'll talk about a bit later about um, you know how can we communicate risk probabilities 
and uncertainties um, to members of the public so that they can make um, decisions. And I think a point that relates to on that that relates to something that Christina just said is that usually if you want to try and communicate uncertainties, um, you want to encode your data in a way that um, where that in, uh, uncertainty information is intrinsic. So a lot of the time with visualizations that you see out there, they've got really hard edges and they imply more precision than is in the data. So I think particularly for health, that's um, some important things to consider. Great, thank you. Um, my next question, I guess, kind of leads on, and this is an audience question um, from what you were saying, Christina, about um, how, how people read the data and simplicity. So the question is, does data visualization contribute towards widening the digital divide between those who regularly see and can interpret graphs and those who glaze over when they see a chart? Um, maybe you'd like to expand on what you were saying, Christina? In terms of it widening the divide? Well, I mean, I guess it can do. I think I think good visual visualization should narrow the divide if possible. Um, but but I think you know what if you're trying to communicate something important about the science, visualization can be a really important part of it, but you can't it can't be the only part of it. So I think there always has to be a way someone could find that just using words somewhere so that you, you don't kind of say, well, you have to be able to interpret this chart to be able to get that information. It has to be in really simple language somewhere where you in, in maybe in long form in the paragraph, but also in the headline or a summary. Right. This is what this is. Right. And then yeah. and then you can explain it in a bit more detail. And then someone can also look at the chart because you have to allow for different people's preferences for how they get information as well. So although I think visualization can be an, a fabulous communication tool, you do need to always think about how else am I providing that information to people? Yeah, of course. So narrative description plays a huge role in visualization as well. Um, Mengdi and Roger, do you have anything you'd want to add to that? Or? Uh, I'd agree, definitely. Narrative description, really important. Um, one thing I'd say against that though is that because uh, we talked about kind of what makes a good visualization and whilst I was saying oh, it's sort of context specific I think there are some generalizable things and one of those I always have at the back of my mind is um, is a visualization necessary that is is using a visualization the most effective way of communicating this thing so whilst absolutely you need text to accompany it and often actually communicating using words which are more easily understandable is more effective but for a visualization to be used, I think there needs to be a clear um, a demonstration that it, you wouldn't be able to capture the thing that you're trying to capture so easily via other means. If you could do it via other means, then you know a summary statistic is often a lot better and more convenient. So, yeah, I really agree with uh, you two have said, and uh, I think one part um, I'd like to add on is about uh, data literacy of uh, the targeted user, because obviously when people understand the graph differently, they will re uh, end up with different interpretations. And especially in health, about opinions. Opinions of uh, a health question, a problem can usually be very formed. And even though you present your data in an objective way, sometimes a uh, human tends to, be, um, to behave, have this confirmation bias and they select what they want to read, then um, an uh, effective way we saw from the interaction study is to help them ask a question and make them feel curious and ask why and let them to look for the answer uh, after the question. Well, so traditional visualization, let's say you put a single graph and maybe just point, uh, let's say, a scholar plot, and that doesn't necessarily to invoke the question. But I think you agree with Christina, I have narratives and they're saying why, why it's important to look at this data is will be very useful. Great, thanks very much, Mengdi. Um, so I guess we've touched on this a little bit, but for each of you, I guess some of the um, the issues that you encounter might be different. 
So a question I have is, what are some of the data quality issues um, when dealing with big data, particularly for health that you've come across? Um, maybe Mengzi, would you like to go with this one? <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I think this is, a, this is a very interesting question because in health data, um, from the ones I have been dealing with, they rely on human input. They rely on human curation. Um, therefore, it's going to lead to lots of delay or missing data because of their, because of certain uh, things happens at the beginning, or there's a certain arbitrary aggregation methods created by the structure or how the things has been organized. So, for example, when we see the NHS test and trace program, the data has been aggregated from Thursday to Wednesday. And all the other weekly statistics has been usually aggregated from Monday to Sunday. So using this data, answering, OK, uh, in week one, how many estimated infection, uh, infected people has been really successfully traced? It's just we can't answer this kind of question. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, that's the biggest, biggest data quality issue. Yeah. Great, thanks, Mindy. And Christina, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, I mean, health data is notoriously difficult to work with because it's really complicated and there are a lot of errors in it. Partly, um, and, and also the way things are coded changes with time. So if you're looking at specifically like hospital data and stuff, that's the real case. And for COVID, along with all the things Mengdi was saying, there are also just fundamental biases that you need to be very aware of when you're showing it and explaining it and interpreting it. For instance, that confirmed cases that is the most, you know, which is the number reported every day, depends strongly on people getting symptoms, realizing they have symptoms and then getting a test and then how long it takes that test to get reported. And that changes over time. It changes with communication. It changes with testing availability. It changes with lab capacity. Um, and it changes with the age of people getting infected. So children get less fewer symptoms. An adult. So, and now it's all changing because we're now using, you know, a million and a half lateral flow device tests on asymptomatic people every day. It fundamentally changes what the case numbers mean. Mm. And if you don't, so, so for instance, like there are still some people out there who will plot case numbers from last March to now when the testing has completely changed since then. And you just cannot, you shouldn't, they should not be on the same chart. So, I think that kind of thing I think is really important, which isn't about an error in, in putting in the data. It's, it's fundamentally understanding how that data came to exist. And I think that is true for any kind of measure you're, you want to show, whether it's health or something else. If you don't understand how that data gets to be collected and what it means, you cannot visualise it well. OK, thank you very much, Christina. Roger, would you like to add anything? No, I'd agree with that. I, the, the point Christina makes is, the one that I had noted down about the uh, the quality of the data. I think people, and I definitely put myself in this category, who work in visualization, get very excited about the end game. You know, kind of, I can imagine how I could uh, expose some interesting structure in this data set using these techniques without maybe thinking so heavily about the underlying data and not just the accuracy precision type things, but yeah, the types of things that Christina was talking about, the kind of underlying confounds, which. Yeah, are all ripped through the case data. So it makes sense to look at case data for a, maybe the first wave, maybe sort of March until June, July, but then got a completely different regime. And so taking that into a, account is really important. But I don't, I don't feel particularly well placed to comment on these because I'm probably a serial offender for uh, <laughs> doing what Christina said not to do. <laughs> very much, Roger. Um, following on then from what uh, you were saying, Christina, for COVID-19, um, for example, there are always so many different types of data and data sources to choose from. So how do you make a decision on what data to use and what sources to use when creating visualizations? You're on mute, Christina, sorry. There we go. Right. Yeah. Don't know quite why that. Anyway, um, I think that is a really interesting question, and it's something that I I try and think about a lot every week, and it and it does change like week to week. So what I try and do is you look at, especially with COVID, the more data you can look at, 
the better idea you have of actually what's going on because something is going on right in the mm -hmm. out there um and it's kind of your job to work out what it is and for that you need you know case data hospitalized data less so death data um outbreak data testing data and and demographics ethnicity region um deprivation age and and what you're really trying to understand is about spread and where things are going and um and then from that once you kind of worked out what you think is going on then you think okay how can i best illustrate that and so sometimes it'll be case data sometimes it's positivity data sometimes it might be hospital data and but then you have to explain briefly why you pick that data and then explain what other kinds of data either support or don't support that so, some, so sometimes i'll say i'll show one graph and then i'll say this is all entirely consistent with ONS infection survey and PO react study the hospitalization data so i'm pretty sure this is a representative of what's going on sometimes like um a couple of times back in the summer where case numbers were going up positivity rates were flat and say the Zoe symptom tracker app was going down so conflicting information and then you say okay well actually I'm not quite sure what's going on because there's a conflicting information so sometimes you kind of have to explain where things aren't matching up um, mm -hmm. I try to well, I'm trying to think what other kind of examples there are um I think uh, often I really like using the ONS infection survey, particularly if I, if I want to look at age breakdowns because it's not based on symptoms and it's mm -hmm. not based on getting a test. So we already know that people in more deprived areas, for instance, are less likely to get tested because it, it doesn't really do you any good to get a test if you can't isolate. Mm -hmm. And also it catches children. So but then it's it's lagged and it's a you know it's like a week two weeks old and it has its own biases in it so so for that for different kind of purposes i prefer certain types of data as well great thank you very much christina mengdi would you like to add anything yeah sure um i think it depends on what i want to create a visualization to do like is it for research purpose for researchers uh, authorities to look at it to answer a very expert question or is it for sending a general public to communicate the importance of certain steps or to communicate the risk of certain behavior um so for the um for the let, uh, late latter one i usually prefer to choose more consistent and the, the data set that is available across a longer time period as kind of giving the credibility for the public user to accept, they look at, oh, we have been reading this data source since the start. It's been running for a whole year. Uh, maybe it's more, uh, maybe it's more, um, brings more certainty. Well, for the um, for the first purpose, I completely agree with uh, Christina. It's very context based. And as mentioned, uh, uh, um, in the past year, we have seen lots of data come out for a single purpose and some of them just disappeared uh, some of them have a have a delay of one week later tends to two weeks and it's uh, it's tricky to to pick the solid data source but i agree that uh, having a wider collection of uh, evidence and provide a transparent description on why i select the a rather than b is uh, is very uh, very important Thanks, Mengdi. And Roger, do you have anything you'd like to add? I don't really have anything above what's been said, actually, to <laughs> add on that one. That's great. My next question is for you, Roger, um, based around your uh, paper, your recent paper, Guidelines and Recommendations for Mapping COVID-19 Prevalence. Um, can you share some of the key outcomes from that paper? Yes. One thing to probably say is that the title's changed it's um uh in response to some review feedback but it, 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 it should be getting through it's uh, absolutely fine <laughs> but uh, it, rather than providing guidelines what we really do is um discuss um a particular approach to looking at um how we can analyze change over time um, in cases with geography so the reason why it's quite exciting for us is that we saw journalists and others around the time of the first wave 
um, developing lots of graphics that we'd sort of, as spatial analysts and spatial data visualization people, we'd been doing for, for a while. And so it's sort of um, on the back of that, exploring um, um, the sort of design space for looking at change over time in case trajectories with geography, but also whether or not we can encode absolute cases and relative cases, all the things that you tend to be interested in when you're looking at um, whether the rates are going up or down, where they're going up or down by how much, where the priorities are. So it, it's sort of a sort of design space paper for doing um, that type of thing. In terms of like genuine recommendations and guidelines for looking at uh, these type of data, I think uh, and for kind of representing it visually, certainly thinking really, really carefully about the data themselves is important. But mm. particularly with the first wave, there wasn't a, there wasn't so much that we we could have done there. And um, however, I think I was really impressed and quite excited by the type of um, graphics that were pro being produced and also kind of the responsible reporting, I think, that was happening from like Financial Times, um, Guardian, New York Times, Washington Post, so kind of they, they were kind of thinking through these things really, really well. So you, you might remember um, John Burr Murdoch's, um, they, they ended up being called death charts, but their case trajectories comparing different countries. And uh, that received um, some criticism because it involved a log scale um, to affect comparison. And people would say, oh, no one, no one understands what log scales are and everything else. But I, I think they do, and, and the, you didn't really need to understand them. All you needed to do was uh, kind of understand how to read the chart for comparisons. So this is a long way of saying that I think um, what was happening there with that chart. So I sort of lost my flow. Yeah, with 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 the sort of stuff that came out quite early on by data journalists, which I was impressed with. They, I, what I think was impressive is that they thought carefully about the comparisons that they wanted to affect, and um, how best those could be achieved and also how to communicate concepts that aren't so familiar to people. So we had these kind of exponential doubling and tripling in case counts. And, and when you had these charts, I should really show one, but with a, a log scale, those charts were annotated um, with gradients that associated with a doubling of cases and a tripling of cases. And, and so all of those kind of uh, sort of quite obvious design features, I think meant that uh, you know, most people could understand how to read those charts. And I think that was quite cool. Um, yeah. So I've, I've gone away from my uh, uh, the paper, but uh, yeah, I, I really need to share a link of that stuff to explain it. So. I mean, feel free to share a link in the in the chat if you would like to. But thank you very much for that yeah. answer. Um, it was a really interesting paper to read. Um, so over the course of the pandemic, we've all learned a lot about contact tracing. Uh, and my question is, how could we have better use data to explain and utilize something? Um, Christina, maybe you would like to go for this one. Yeah, you're breaking up a bit, but I think I got the question, which was about concert tracing. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'll let, I'll let, uh, Mengzi, if I just talk a bit more about kind of how the data could have been presented to learn more, but I think we could have learned so much more had we tried. And I find it very frustrating that we didn't and we still not. In fact, the Royal Statistical Society um, released a, a call for extra research last summer, which was never action. So just basic things, for instance, the WHO and the CDC recommend that you test all contacts. We don't do that. We only test symptomatic contacts. I think that that means we lost the fantastic opportunity to understand spread, how things spread from someone once they've been positive, how many of their contacts test positive, how many of them are asymptomatic, and then to do backwards tracing where you kind of see, well, where could they have met to understand exactly where people were getting infected? Because the kind of the evidence around, say, um, hospitality um, is quite circumstantial it's quite compelling just because we've seen that same pattern across the world but it is still circumstantial and we could have had the opportunity to actually work out you know are these areas of high risk to work out how does household transmission work we know that household transmission is much more common that once someone has it in your household you're much more likely to get it but really understanding those attack rates who was the first person to get covid how does it spread how long does it take we don't we still don't know that and that 
just seems such a wasted opportunity when effectively the population that you could do this on is right there in front of you. And we could have done it using the ONS infection survey as well. You know, again, you've got people who you know have COVID. Yeah. So why not learn from that as much as you can about, about their contacts um, and what that means for, for tracing? And even things like how quickly do you have to trace someone? If you, can, if you can work out exactly how long contacts take before they test positive, that's a massive piece of information that you can tell. So things like that, I think we've really kind of missed an opportunity to learn from. Yeah. Thanks so much, Christina. Do you have anything to add on the visualization perspective, Mandy? Um, visualization perspective, not particularly sure, but I just uh, like feel so uh, like feel so true when Christina mentioned about we lost opportunity, especially with such a high cost of lots of people contribute, participate, and they're um, not even need to mention about the money part. Um, so this is a incredibly, uh, the opportunity is not only to provide evidence saying um, it is not working or it is working, it's just we have no way, no way to evaluate it now and mm -hmm. after in the future. And the question is, will be remain a forever question mark and is it the right thing to do? Um, another part I'd like to uh, mention is like contact tracing has been, can be done in lots of different ways. Um, like privacy preservation data analysis with this platform with automatic data automation, all those things can be set up and it's a very established research field in computer science. But we didn't dis didn't decide to go to that pathway, and that's also an opportunity lost uh, from that part. Yeah. Thanks, Mindy. And Roger, do you have anything more you'd like to add? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree, agree with everything that's been said. It feels like there are a lot of assumptions still that are being made that need to be um, tested. And also, I think just reflecting back on, like, because it's a year now since everything kicked off, <laughs> uh, just um, I, I remember all of the, the kind of coverage of it and um, really uh, persuasive people, from epidemiologists and others talking about you know uh, the, whether or not we need to have uh, social distancing and the the relative benefits of masks and and uh, and lots of assumptions about the nature of the virus itself and how it spread and uh, you know though many of those proved you know to be wrong and, and so and I, I don't know it's just, it's just interesting like I remember um, a debate on whether or not we should like so the obvious thing that's become clear is that we didn't lock down soon enough wasn't it and and uh, I remember a really furious debate on Channel 4 News between two people one was making lots of assumptions about how people would behave under lockdown for which there wasn't really strong evidence but they were very compelling professor uh, and another who had just hacked around with some modeling who wasn't communicating very compelling but made the obvious point that if you've got an exponential doubling in cases, the quicker that you soon, the sooner that you lock down, the better. And that seemed like a really obvious point, but because the other person had more authority, I was kind of more persuaded by them. I, I just think it's interesting, isn't it? How uh, I think I'm going off the topic again, but how uh, <laughs> how important sort of the authority of the person is and the way in which they communicate is to deci mm -hmm. decision making. I think that applies also to visualization. Um, yeah. As well. Thanks so much, Roger. Um, my next question is, um, what have been some of the areas that have been really difficult to get data on during the pandemic? Um, maybe, Mengdi, would you like to start with this one? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I think there are quite a lot of areas, as we just talked about contact tracing, like we, yeah. it was something we could have done, but we didn't do, like it was by decision. And think other parts that is uh, very difficult by nature is uh, about the estimation of the prevalence and incidence across time. So how mm -hmm. many people in the population are estimated, uh, estimated to be uh, COVID positive? Um, obviously, there's a lot of ways to do that uh, through sim reported symptoms. And recently, I think they're doing studies using wastewater sampling. Um, there are also UN, uh, ONS infection survey. Uh, it, was still, it seems like we still didn't have a really clear grab 
of this thing. Uh, another part I was uh, particularly care about, like I personally care about, is the uh, support figures. So, like the people who are asked to isolate, how are they supported to keep mm -hmm. isolation? And I think that's quite important because that's uh, leads directly to the effectiveness of isolation and uh, whether um, whether we are uh, providing a good framework for this contact trace and isolate um, stages to work. But we don't really have data on that. No. Great, thanks, Mandy. And Christina, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I mean, I think Mandy kind of highlighted the main things. I think one of the things that's been frustrating is that when they presented case numbers, mm -hmm. they presented it by pillar. So pillar one, which is testing in hospitals, and then pillar two, which is testing in the community. But it would have been really helpful to understand testing by symptom status, because that the hospital testing included patients, but also healthcare staff to get to the hospital. Mm. Pillar two included mainly symptomatics, now includes symptomatics and asymptomatics, and it also includes people who were regularly screened for whatever reason. And so that can make it really hard to interpret the case numbers and interpret positivity rates. And they are now splitting it out by type of test, which is good. Um, but again, that would be really helpful to also know location of tests. Like, is it part of the school testing? Is it workplace testing? Because if you can understand where the case is coming from, you get a much better understanding of, of what's going on now. Which And so I think that that kind of detail has been missing and made it harder to work out what was happening. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Christina. And Roger, anything from your perspective that has been difficult? To uh, later I don't, I, not really. No, I haven't been as heavy in the data to, to comment on that as I could have been. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. I have another audience question, which I think um, you might be able to give uh, some insight on, which is when facing the complicated public health problem, um, with so many numbers, measures, and daily updates, how do we keep audiences focused and avoid information overload? Maybe Roger, would you like to start with this one? Yeah, uh, it, it's a really good question. I don't know if you saw this um, came off my Twitter feed a couple of weeks ago, but Camden Brewery, who do the Camden Hells Lager, uh, came up with a, a new uh, <laughs> beer called uh, I don't know if I can say this, but um, expletive. I'm sick of um, COVID-19, and then on it, on the on the text, it said, "I'm sick of all of these things like social distancing, but with a few F words chucked in." And one of them was, "I'm sick of seeing graphics." And I thought about that. I thought, "Yeah, actually, I am a bit as well." Which is really bad, isn't it? As a visualization person. So yeah, I agree that there's massive information overload. At the same time, I'm really excited by the the type, as I said earlier, about the types of analysis that have been produced. And like, I don't think we've ever seen, because, you, because you know, the whole world stopped, hasn't it? Um, and, but, but it stops at a moment where, you know, data science has, you know, happened 10 years ago. So there are loads and loads of people who have the skills to chuck around with data sets and share them on code repositories and everything. Like, I think there's just been immense amounts of data analysis and really impressive presentation. What I think we can do about the information overload is, um, well, I don't know if we can do so, but I think having a select number of people who are really compelling and um, present with authority, but also um, um, who you can trust, I think is really important. So I, I'm really pleased to see people like David Spiegelhalter, who are, we kind of routinely do the rounds on Radio 4 and other outlets. Um, sort of communicating what's happening with the um, underlying data. And I think um, I've been impressed really recently be, by, between, behind with how, um, you know, all of the, the stuff around vaccine confidence is being reported. So the fact that uh, there's the association between uh, the AstraZeneca virus and blood clots is a spurious one. There's no significant, there's no case for it because um, uh, rates of Blood clots are no higher than the population as a whole. Take into the fact that there's this thing about in Germany, oh, it's there's this rare type. But actually, even if you take into account that rare type, once you adjust for the fact that 50 plus people have been vaccinated and that rare type is elevated in 50 plus age groups, it's no higher than the population as a whole. So, so kind of having people with authority communicating those things using words, I think, is really 
is really important, um, especially when you've got an epidemic. Uh, I, I, I suppose the danger with having a large cohort of uh, data scientists messing around with gra graphics is that um, it can both add to information loads and overload, but also it can lead to kind of spurious claims as well. So I think whilst I started off by saying it's really exciting, we've got all these people doing stuff on data sets, there is a risk to doing that. And mm. I think there have been more responsible people in the visualization community, which I'm attached to, uh, deliberately not kind of chucking up uh, loads of charts and graphics and, and sort of leaving some of the in communication to epidemiologists, which I think has been good as well. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. Christina, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I mean, there's certainly <laughs> on Twitter, a lot of people trying to do visualizations and what I find is that there are some people who I follow and I find useful because they're very comprehensive it's you know summaries of the data so I look at it and then I kind of think okay so what's going on and then I would then translate that into a, sim a much simpler way of presenting it if I'm doing public communication so I think there are definitely people who are speaking to different audiences um you know, there's there's this one guy on Twitter who loves doing like phase plots of hospitalizations, which to him are incredibly informative, but to the layperson are, are meaningless. You know, so it's kind of so you can kind of look at that and then you and you can get a good picture of what's happening. But then again, you, I think you do have to then um, translate it in terms of overload. I don't, I don't know, you know, because it's been I think people are overloaded because it's been a year of this. You know, it's been a year and it's not mm -hmm. over. Mm. You pretty much every public health expert, including Whitney and Valence, think there's going to be a third wave in autumn. Sorry, guys. So um, <laughs> it's not. I'm, you know, I'm tired. I don't. Mm. I didn't think I would be here. Mm. But one of the reasons that say Indie Sage is still going is because there is a public appetite for this. Yeah. People do want to know, and. And actually, although, you know, we have been kind of saying there, there are the kind of downfalls in the data and it's not perfect and blah, 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 and it can be irritating. The fact is that actually in the UK, we have a lot of data. We can download it. We can play with it. Mm -hmm. And that is a real credit, actually. I, I think yeah. we should be, I, we should give real credit to the people that have been producing it, particularly the dashboard, the COVID dashboard on the government website. They have carried on improving it. They asked for feedback it's been actually pretty damn good. So I yeah. think sometimes as well, we have to say that the reason that there is visual overload of UK data is because we've been able to access it. Mm -hmm. um, so we should be pleased about that. Yeah, thanks very much, Christina. Mengdi, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, sure. I think I'm the, I'm the victim of information overloaded somehow. <laughs> And they're completely agree with Christina and Roger. It's kind of a, a price we have to pay to have the pandemic ongoing, to have a crisis ongoing for so long. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I, I sometimes think, um, made, although made some mistakes and there have uh, certain people made the wrong claims, but the ongoing arguments provide lots of information, visualization, as a, a step towards a better solution or better response to the crisis. And we're improving all the time. Looking at UK, I think UK is one of the country have the best transparent COVID data, COVID-19 data so far. And uh, this needs a lot of effort and collaboratively. Um, so, so we have, we have to note that. Um, in terms of information overload, uh, I don't, I can't think of anything that's so good in the short term. Yeah. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, to add to what all of you have been saying, I guess there has been lots of, I mean, this year probably most of the general public has seen more data visualization than ever before, but that also is a good thing in terms of increasing understanding of data visualization. Um, but Christina, you mentioned that sometimes you you take the, the information that people put out and maybe change it for some of your um, public 
communication. Um, so what needs to change in order for data analysis to be easier and more useful for public health and public communication? Um, Christina, would you like to start with this one? So I'm not quite sure what you mean by what needs to change. Um, maybe uh, how can how can things be more consistent or um, more or, or or just what are some things to keep in mind um, when communicating with the public? I mean, I think I'm not sure things necessarily have to be more consistent. I think you know for government messaging, yes, they should mm. be using consistent types of plots. Um, I think if it's good visualization, it's understandable on its own terms, and it doesn't matter if it looks different from how yeah. someone else has done it. Um, trying to think, what was the other bit? There was another bit and I had something to say, now I've forgotten what it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is what needs to be easier or more useful for public health and public Right, right, okay. Um, I think I think sometimes it helps to explain why your visualization visual mm. um, viewing things in a certain way. So, for instance, when you're choosing to put things on a log scale, right? A lot of people don't really like log scales or they misinterpret them. So, I think having just a, like so, a, a small sentence somewhere on the graph saying this lets you compare. Um, across things that have very different amounts on it or just or just kind of explaining what it means um say for instance like that like the beautiful log plots that John Byrne Murdoch did at the FT that everyone was glued to back a year ago yeah. um and sometimes you know so if you're looking at just one country you might not want to use a log plot you might just want to use actual numbers um or I'm trying to think what other kind of examples there are of what needs to change. I mean, I mean, you know, like the more scientifically literate your audience is, the more you can do. But mm. without changing that, then I'm not sure really what what needs to change. I mean, I think there's I think so much is already really good. Yeah. I think that, that there is something about how if you look at like on Twitter, the stuff that works gets shared and there's a kind of a little little Twitter revolution process going on where you've seen certain types of visualization take off because people like them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I've, I've noticed that. So for instance, I've seen something, I've shared it, I start using it, other people start using it and you, and, and you kind of end up on this convergent evolution of like, this is a good way of sharing this type of information. For instance, yes. um, like uh, dot plots of last week compared to this week, which can give you a really good overview. If you do it over local authorities, you just have two bits of information. You can see if things are going up, down or about the same. Um, so I, I think like that's social media has been quite nice that way of giving you a little test, a test environment. See, does this work? Does this not work? Um, I think journalists are pretty good, actually. Data science journalists, I think it has been a good year for them. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll just stop talking because I think I'm about to start talking. That's nonsense. Right. <laughs> no, I think that it's great to hear that you think that um, things have been going really well and, and there's not that much that needs to change. Um, I realise we're running out of time, so I want to ask you the final question, which is if there's one key thing you'd like to share that maybe you've learned over the last year, um, just for everyone in this conversation and everyone who watches this to take away about data visualisation and good communication, what would that be? Maybe, Roger, would you like to start? Uh, yes, I'll try and link it to the point that Christina made, because I think um, what Christina was identifying there was, well, implicitly, was that the successful graphics were successful because they exposed comparisons that are useful. So with visualisation, it's really easy to do something that looks really beautiful and complex. Um, more useful is something that is um, may look complex, but hopefully doesn't look complex, but that exposes some useful structure and if you're going to expose some useful structure often you need to do some type of transformation or on your data or and or, or some type of um, comparison against an expectation those are difficult to con convey well but the beautiful but john Mur Burn Up, Bur Bur murdoch charts are an excellent example of that so um i think more visual there were, uh, 10 years ago there was loads of visualization i can think of someone in particular but i'm not going to pick on them <laughs> <laughs> which got shared a lot, really popular, but uh, was great at making things that are simple, look complex and beautiful. I think we're beyond that now, which is really cool. And we're de generating visualizations that do 
communicate useful structure well. Um, I think one thing that's missing, which I'd like to see more of, is right now actually, is how do we um, convey probabilities so that they can be understood? Because they're so abstract, conditional probabilities, but they're so necessary right now as we try evaluate whether or not we should be having a vaccine uh, what's the risk and there are some really brilliant techniques that are being developed and tested in the visualization community some called icon arrays which you'll see you won't know the term but you'll notice them uh, if you see them uh, and there are loads of others so i think um, that's a gap but i'm talking too much so i'll <laughs> hand over and i agree the point that there's been some really good work as well thanks very much for it and uh, mengdi would you like to add anything What's your key learning? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I agree that uh, the visualization is particularly useful in this in the past one year. And kind of reflect. Uh, I I have a reflection is that um, should we consider data visualization literacy, the ability of reading visualization, the ability of creating informative visualization as a um, not essential, but more desired, not required skills. Should we, as we all from the university education sector, um, should we in, consider it in the program, in the courses for a more general purpose? And that's definitely going to enhance the, if the public data literacy increase, it's going to make the visualization, message sending, communi public communication easier. And I think from the education, perspective uh, is kind of a responsibility of uh, contribute to contribute to that. Yeah, thanks very much, Mindy and Christina. So I love icon arrays. <laughs> Just <to say. laughs> and, um, and actually last week in the in the Indie Sage weekly briefing, I, w I went through false positives with LSDs and why you need confirmatory testing. And I did it, I mean, not an array, but using kind of groups of people showing that if you have enough mm. people who don't have it, you can still get a large number and, and how you can really cut that down. And that kind of step through thing, I think helps people get it. Now, in terms of different vaccine strategies, I think that's a bit more complicated. In terms of the big thing I've learned, right, okay, I am now going to horrify the two other people on this panel, and I apologise mm -hmm. in advance, because they are both much more technically adept than I am at data visualisation, because I'm not a data visualisation expert at all. I'm somebody who looks a lot at data and tries to work out what it means, and then I tell people what I think it means. And um, and so sometimes I've done these graphs and you're like, wow, how did you do that graph? I really like it. And I was like, well, I did it in Excel and then and then I added to it in PowerPoint. And they look at me like I'm from the Stone Age, which I, I appreciate I am. But you can and it takes a lot of time. I mean, it's not a particularly efficient way of doing things, but it does mean that you can actually spend the time to create the information that you want to be on a single thing. And I'm often thinking about how would I tweet this? And I want when I tweet something, people to to not be able to misinterpret it if they haven't read the tweet. So if you share the image, I think it has to have the information that people need to interpret it on there. So I'll often add text, I'll add arrows, I'll add this is what this means. So that mm -hmm. so that you're helping people if that image gets shared without any of the context to it. So things like that. Excel and PowerPoint are your friend, although they do obviously limit to the kind of things you can do. And I know that I'll probably get excommunicated from this group now. <laughs> 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 Um, but anyway, I, I'm sorry, we've run over time. Um, I have so many more questions I could ask, but it's been a really interesting discussion. And thank you so much to you, Christina, Roger and Mengdi for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned, this session has been recorded, but it will be available on our website if you would like to share it. But um, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us today and I hope you have a lovely week. Thank you. Thank you.